So I will be recording this event for later. So if you have to uh, tap out, life happens, totally get it. Just tap out and uh, catch the recording later. Really uh, just ask that while you're here, this is all that you're doing. So that's our only ask so that when you're speaking, you know the person is listening to you. That's, that's what we're here for. Um, and it is my honor and my privilege to get to introduce to you today, Vice Admiral Lisa Franchetti. Um, never have we had such a highly anticipated uh, guest speaker. We have over 70 people who uh, signed up, which is twice what we normally see about. Um, so just a huge response and people texting me all day today, emailing me because they know I get nervous too. So friends are like, you'll do fine. <laughs> Thank you, friends. You know who you are. Um, so thank you for that. And um, just think what a reminder if we have, uh, what a gentle reminder that somebody who right now is in charge of uh, the entire J5 on Capitol Hill right now, strategies, plans, developing transition. I mean, I can't imagine how much on a tether you must be on, ma'am, that you would have to just be responsive to the needs of uh, our country right now and that you would not only dedicate uh, this hour to us today, uh, but all the time that you dedicated leading up to this to um, pick the date, set the time, let me work with your staff, uh, work with me on your notes, pick the video. I mean, so much went into this and you'll see that uh, as you hear her speak today, you'll know that this uh, a lot went into this today. Um, so if that's not a reminder, as we look at our own lives um, and think, can we spend an hour, one for this and maybe to someone else in our life who needs some mentorship or listening. Um, if uh, Admiral Franchetti can do this for us, uh, then as a reminder, we can do it for others too. So that's my real hope is that we take your example here today, ma'am, and that we go uh, and mentor others or uh, be mentorable to someone else um, because you're making it happen. So thank you for that. And uh, just a real pleasure to get to introduce you uh, today. All right, well, thanks, Emily, and hello, everyone. It really is a, a pleasure and an honor to have the chance to talk with all of you today. And, uh, you know, I just want to say, Emily, on behalf of everybody here, I really want to say thank you. Uh, thank you to you for everything you do to bring us together, really, you know, for one hour a month to listen, to share, and uh, learn from, and also to empower each other. You're a very busy person, too. And uh, again, I know everyone appreciates the hard work that you do to put into this. Well, for those I've never met, again, great to uh, virtually meet you. And uh, you know, someday when COVID is gone, we will all get to meet with each other in person and that will be wonderful. But I think in some ways this is, uh, you know, it's the next best thing. And, and we're bringing together, as you said, 70 folks uh, kind of from around the world really to uh, have a chance to be together. And that's a pretty powerful thing uh, when you think about it. Uh, just a little tiny bit about me and, you know, I'm a service warfare officer. Uh, yeah, as Emily said, I'm here on the J5 right now and uh, I've had a great 35-year uh, career, really many wonderful teams to work with and all over the world. It's been a, a fantastic opportunity and I continue to love what I do every day. Uh, on the personal side, I'm uh, married. I have a 14-year-old daughter. So for those of you with kids dealing with, uh, you know, kids in virtual school, I feel you, feel your pain. Uh, feel your, uh, you know, your Wi-Fi being used up uh, all the time. And uh, again, I'm just like everyone else, just like you are. We are making it work one day at a time and, uh, you know, but continue to enjoy the uh, many blessings that we have here as, uh, as Americans and, of course, in our great Navy. So, you know, when Emily uh, talked to me and asked me to join in uh, one of the sessions, you know, I thought about, well, what could I share with you that might be relevant and useful and maybe even a little bit different, thinking about things that maybe I hadn't really talked about before, I hadn't really heard anybody uh, talk about to me. And so while we were working hard to set the date, uh, you know, I was in Italy at the time we started talking and then, you know, then I had moved back to the States and I had started up uh, in N7, which was after about two and a half years of being the Sixth Fleet Commander in Italy. Uh, and then I had also been selected for another job to be here in the in the J5. So I was going through a lot of transition. You know, the J5, the J7 job was a job that I had never been on the Navy staff uh, really in over 10 years. I had never been there as a flag officer, and I had just finished up a tour in the J5. Um, but being the J5 is a lot different being the chief of staff in the J5, and I knew that. And so. You know, it was also a little bit of pressure because they haven't had a woman J5 before. So that was all going on in the background uh, as I was getting ready to uh, think about, well, what did I want to talk to you about today? And so uh, as I was getting ready to take on these jobs, I felt this familiar pit 
uh, in my stomach. And maybe some of you felt that pit sometimes, although I had just finished up a really successful tour in fleet command, and it is one of the hardest jobs we ever do in our Navy. I still had this feeling, this nagging feeling that I was not really ready and I did not have all the skills or the experience that I needed to do these new jobs that I was heading to. The people I was relieving, they were pretty much legendary uh, in what they did and all the different skills they had. They were the perfect fit uh, for these jobs. So I really wasn't sure I would be able to live up to the expectations uh, either of the CNO or uh, of the chairman. And I felt like I was a little bit of an imposter and that pretty soon someone was gonna figure it out and, uh, and they would be like, how did you ever get here? And I was really a little bit nervous about that. And so then a light bulb went off in my head and I decided this is what I need to talk to you about today. The imposter syndrome um, or in the TED talk, if you had a chance to look at that, it's pretty short. So I encourage you to do so. They you know, call it imposterism. It's really that feeling in your gut. It's that feeling that you're an imposter that somehow you are out of your league, you will be discovered as being a fraud, uh, you're not deserving of the job that you were selected for or put into, you weren't deserving of a promotion that you got. And so I'm not sure if anybody else has ever felt that way, um, but I know I have pretty much repeatedly throughout my career, and as I just shared with you, even to this day. And so even though the concept of the imposter syndrome was actually first noted back in 1978 through a study that was done with a bunch of college students. I'd really never heard anybody talk about it until about two years ago. And then all of a sudden, once I heard this description, I could really sit and look back over the 33 years I had in the Navy at that point and see many examples of when I had felt this way. And some of my close peers had talked to me about how they felt that way, but we never really had a label. Uh, we never had a name for it. And somehow having this name for this thing that I was feeling, it, it made me reflect on how I had been able to overcome these feelings, these really strong feelings at times of self-doubt. So in case you didn't get a chance to watch the TED talk, let me just say very briefly that in, imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon, or imposter experience, lots of different names for this, and they describe it really as imposterism, can be described as a nagging feeling that you're not good enough, you're not deserving of a new position, you don't deserve a seat at the table, and, uh, and really that you don't belong to the club. And it's really, as they found in uh, these studies, it's almost a universal feeling. It happens to everyone, it's women, men, older, younger, it's uh, many people feel this way, but it may disproportionately affect underrepresented and underprivileged groups. So this imposterism is pretty common in high achievers. It's common in creative people and students. And then, and once it starts when you're a student, it often persists and, and follows you along right into your work environment. And then for our discussion today, in particular, you know, women uh, in the work environment will tend to judge their own performance as worse than it objectively is, where men tend to judge their own performance as higher or better than it actually is. So there's many ways that the imposterism can manifest itself. Um, first of all, you have these bad feelings, you have this anxiety, these nagging feelings, and then it can cause you to start to devalue your own worth you can start undermining your own experience and your expertise. And then it can really become self-limiting. And as I was thinking about the term of our discussion today, all of lean in, it can cause you not to lean in. In fact, it can cause you to subtract yourself uh, from the equation. And so again, why does this matter? I think really, if you let these feelings persist, um, they can come to dominate your thinking. And then again, that's gonna prevent you from sharing ideas it could potentially prevent you from excelling in your job. It could prevent you from leaning in and motivating and mentoring those people around you because you may not feel that what you're about to say or what you have to say is valuable or will be valuable to them. And it can even affect you in your ability to move up uh, in our organization or really any organization when you think about it.
So as again, as you saw in the, uh, in the video, we, we are definitely, if you have these thoughts, and if you don't have these thoughts, I'm really happy for you. But if you, don't, if you do have these thoughts, uh, you're not alone, and it, because I'm here with you. Uh, but also, as you saw in the video, lots of people experience this. You saw Maya Angelou and her comments in the video. You heard Albert Einstein and his comments in the video. And I was looking up to see some other people that have recently talked about this, and like Tina Fey, she is another one who uh, has recently talked about this, this very thing. So I really think that half the battle uh, in this conversation is really just understanding that we are not alone uh, in these types of thoughts. And I think that it really helps that once you understand or we all understand that plenty of successful people all around you have these same concerns and somehow they are both overcoming them and they're continuing to do great jobs wherever they are, we can start putting together you know, some of our own strategies uh, to get after these very real feelings that we should all acknowledge, these are very real feelings that can produce great anxiety and again, limit your ability to live up to your full potential. So I thought I would share with you a few uh, strategies that, that I've used and I uh, continue to use. Um, okay, so the first one is uh, visualizing my success. So this is, means that essentially conducting sort of a mental rehearsal and imagining yourself successfully completing an activity, successfully doing something. I am visualizing myself standing on the bridge of my ship, saying to the OD, take in all lines. I've run through my head what that's going to be like. I know what's going to happen next. I know how this is going to go. And now I became more comfortable on my first underway. I visualize myself doing an interview with the chairman. What is that going to go like? What am I going to say? What if I don't get to say anything? What if I have 30 seconds? What's my five minute speech about why I'm the best person for the job? What's my 30 second speech? That really helped me overcome the fact that many of us don't like to toot our own horns. We don't want to sell ourselves for a job because a lot of times we've never really had to do that. So again, visualizing precisely how you want to navigate a situation before it happens can help you do exactly that. The second strategy is that we should own you, you should own, we should all own our accomplishments. I think a lot of times women tend to explain away their success. They ascribe it to the team, to good luck, good timing, to good connections, to pretty much anything uh, except their own ability. So practice saying how proud you are of what you've accomplished and taking credit and praise. It's not to say that you should be a credit seeker or a credit hog, and certainly we are always gonna give credit to our teams, but at the same time, recognize that you're the leader of that team, you're a part of that team, and that you are the contributor. Remind yourself that you're as good, you are good at what you do, and that you have talent, and that you belong. You belong at the table, you belong in the room, you belong. Okay, the third one is collect and revisit positive feedback. So, uh, you know, we have uh, an outlook. If you're still a filer, you might have little folders down there on the side and you can just put one that says me. And in there, just drag in there all that good stuff. Positive statements, BZs, someone sent you something nice, stuff it all into there. And then when you start to feel that self-doubt creep in, click on your emails and read back through them. Or you can keep a collection on your desk. When I was heading to Six Fleet, Emil Jackson had a, a little a going away party and she asked everyone to write a little note to me and uh, she gave me a little box to put the notes in. And so I, I was very overwhelmed, especially when I read the notes. And I kept that box right in the middle of the table in my office when I was Six Fleet. So whenever I needed a little pep talk to myself, I could just go over there and grab it. And actually just looking at the box made me remember what was in there. And again, that helped me just put up kind of that defensive shields to doubt and, uh, and push it away. Okay, the fourth one is, you know, talk about your feelings with your, you know, your trusted, with your friends and your trusted colleagues. Again, we're not alone uh, in this conversation. And I think now that we can kind of put a label on what this is imposterism, this is actually normal feeling. 
Um, now you might feel a little bit more comfortable talking about it with other people. A long time ago, I think I was in 05 at the time. Yeah, we were 05 at the time. One of my peers came up to me and said, you know, she had just been selected for this job. And, you know, she didn't really feel like she had all the experience and she wasn't sure how she was going to go about doing it. And, uh, you know, I knew that in reality, it was probably going to be a little bit of a stretch goal uh, for her. But at the same time, I knew she was fully capable of doing it. And so I felt my job, you know, as a colleague was to tell her just that. I wanted to acknowledge her concerns. I wanted to be empathetic to that because I totally understood what she felt like. But at the same time, I wanted to help her boost her confidence and to help her overcome those feelings. I think by talking about them, we can do that for each other. Okay, I'm watching my time on my, my computer there, Emily. Okay, um, I'm only gonna do six, I promise, only six things. Okay, five, the number five, find a centering phrase. And um, I know some of this might sound like a little bit too touchy-feely for some people, and it might be, but I find this centering phrase can be really useful. When self-doubt starts to creep in, your anxiety level is starting to rise, I think a centering phrase can help you reset yourself. You know we're doing this at boot camp. You know, they say, the, the recruits will say, recalibrate, you know, and that gives them the, their breathing exercise. Of course, we got this from special warfare. And they, you know, immediately find that 10 seconds of intercom, and then they can go back at it and move forward. And so when I was uh, at Six Fleet, I don't know how this one came into my mind, but I would say like nerves of steel, nerves of steel. I would just have this nerves of steel going out of my mind. There's a lot of opportunities that I needed to say that when a lot of things were going on and I would do a few deep breaths and I would feel like, okay, I'm ready to go. Another one I heard lately in, the, in Peloton, um, if any of you ride on the Peloton classes, there's an instructor called Chris, named Christine De er Cole. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right, but she's got this thing and I checked it out on our website too. Her mantra is, uh, I am, I can, I will, I do. And if you say that a few times fast, I mean, it's kind of cool. I, can't, I, I am, I can, I will, I do. I am, I can, I will, I do. I mean, it really helps you start believing that just by saying it. And again, so find something, my idea is find something that works for you. And, uh, and then you can use it when you need to, uh, you know, get yourself back into the game or if you're starting to doubt yourself, remember that, that phrase that will help you get back. Okay, and then the last one is, uh, you know, you need to decide to be confident. That is a choice every day. So you have to make a commitment to raising your hand, to volunteering your expertise, and then taking that seat at the table. It really is a conscious decision that you make every day uh, in every moment. So those are my six kind of things, coping strategies that I've used to help me with my own imposterism. And I wish I could say I've been entirely successful at this, um, but I think like everybody, we're all works in progress. And I'll just give you a really quick example. Like earlier this week, I had some introductory calls over at the State Department at some pretty high level of State Department people, higher than I'd ever met uh, before. And I was getting ready for it. I was doing my standard thing. I was going down my imposterism path. I was thinking that I would have nothing to offer these people. They had been in administration for four years. Other people had been in the uh, career civil uh, foreign service for over 35 years. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know how this is gonna go. And I kept being tempted to cancel the calls. But I said, you know what, I'm gonna do it. I studied hard. I visualized uh, exactly how these calls would go. And you know, it went exactly as planned. And in fact, I was so glad I did that because when I went to the most senior person in the State Department for this call, they, he said, so what's on your mind? You know, I was thinking he was gonna like start out with what was his on his mind. But because I had visualized it, I thought about it ahead of time, I already knew what I was gonna say and I, I, I let it out there and got positive feedback um, you know, throughout the call. So again, sometimes I also still don't raise my hand. Uh, I don't talk in a meeting. I may not be confident enough that my idea is useful. And then three minutes later, somebody else, normally a man, uh, raises his hand. Actually, he doesn't raise his hand. He just blurts out the same exact thing that I was going to say. So I still need to work on that. And, uh, but again, I'm just sharing this with you because maybe you have some of those same um, experiences. And again, I'm going to continue because you're kind of who you are. I'm going to overpair pair for everything. I'm going to make sure I, I know uh, the information I need to have. But again, I think just the fact that I can acknowledge um, that I have these challenges is, you know, again, the first step in, uh, in getting over them.
All right, so let me wrap up today um, with a quick story from a, a book I read a, about a year and a half ago um, by Jennifer Palmieri. Um, and it was her book, Dear Madam President. And uh, it's a chapter about uh, being in the room. And again, this is a, a book from the Obama administration. This is not meant to be a political discussion at all. So don't, don't take it that way. It's just an example of a woman who had an opportunity to be in you know, one of the most uh, important and powerful rooms in our nation, the Oval Office. So when she was a junior staff member, this was a couple of administrations before, one of her mentors gave her this advice. I'm just reading it right out of the book. Uh, it says, people take their cues from you. That's it. If you act like you belong in the room, people will believe you do. If you act like your opinion matters, others will too. And then later in a subsequent administration, she came back in and she was much more senior as the White House Deputy Communications Director. And she was in the meeting in the Oval Office one day and uh, one of her colleagues appeared to be holding back on sharing her thoughts. And the president turned to the colleague and said, you are in the room, speak up. She and all the other people in the room right then and there understood that they were all in the room because of their experience, their perspective, and the judgment that they brought with them. And the president needed to hear from each and every one of them. So then by then she was a lot more senior and she thought actually that it was gonna be more, it was gonna be easier, it was gonna be more comfortable to express her views. But then she found that it was even harder because they carried more weight. So to overcome doubt in these situations, she said that she landed on an accommodation that helped her get over herself. Instead of mentally running through all of the people who would be better than her in the job, she decided to accept that there are a lot of talented people in her field and that some people are probably better than her, but not that much better. And then she said, and I'm the one who's in the room now and I'm here for a reason to do a job. So I thought again, that was a pretty powerful uh, example. And what I would tell you is that every one of us is gonna be given that opportunity to be in that proverbial room. So whether it's a job or a meeting or a speech or a conference, how you prepare for that time and then what you choose to do when you get there is totally up to you. All right, so those are some of my personal thoughts on uh, imposterism. I hope this discussion is uh, interesting as we go into our breakout sessions with a little bit of food for thought. And uh, again, I hope some of the things I've said will help you uh, acknowledge your own imposterism if you have it and uh, continue forward on the path to take your well-deserved seat in the room. All right, Emily, back to you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Amal Franchetti. And I love how just universal those stories are. I mean, as I'm listening to you, not only do they apply throughout your career, you've shared them from your junior days to your, even yesterday or this week, um, but that they apply to, you know, different professions. Um, and I often, I do remember when uh, my, that, that same conversation in my head, when I was the reactor officer on Gerald R. Ford, I'd be like, there are so many people who are smarter than me, better than me, could be here, could know the answer to all these questions. But I'm like, but I'm the only one who's here right now. Like I'm the only one wearing this uniform and I'm the one who is the reactor officer right now. So I'm just gonna do it as if I did this. And so I just, I had, I kind of came to that conclusion sort of tripped over it, um, but didn't really know I was tripping over it until you articulated it just now to say, oh, that's, that's exactly what I was doing there and how I got through that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. You do have uh, one question that came out. Uh, Admiral Klein wanted to know the uh, end of your story. So uh, if you'd be willing to share how that little elevator speech went with the 30 seconds, 30 minutes, um, would you be willing to share how that story ends for the, the group, uh, if you recall at all in that story? Yeah, sure. I mean, I had prepared like three arguments, three, like I was felt like I was a lawyer and I was preparing to defend my case for myself for, I was nominated for three different jobs. And I kind of had a story for each one of the, the jobs of why I would be, you know, the best person. And, and for those of you that know me, you know, that was probably pretty hard for me to um, actually articulate those words to actually say that, you know, I'm prepared to say that out loud. Um, you know, in the end, I kind of did not really get a 30 second elevator speech. Uh, you know, the chairman asked a lot of questions and, uh, you know, his, the main question was, do you want to come to the joint staff? 
And uh, of course, that was the one question I had not actually prepared for. And so I did, I said, yes, I do. Yes, of course, I want to come to the joint staff. <laughs> and, uh, but he did say, you know, do you have a preference over these, you know, jobs? And I did say, you know, yes, I would like to be the J5. I feel like that is a job that is best, you know, I am best suited for that job. I will be able to serve you best in that capacity. And uh, if chosen, I look forward to the honor to, you know, having the opportunity to serve you well, uh, especially because I knew we were coming to the transition. So I knew uh, that this will be a lot of work and uh, that I was, I was up to the task. And I wanted to make sure that he knew that. I did also in the interview have the opportunity, you know, to say that I had served in the Pentagon six, on six tours. And, you know, and that I think is something that he was looking for. And so that was a good selling point. So thinking a little bit about, you know, in my own mind, I had already written down all this data of, you know, where I had served and why it would be useful, you know, two overseas tours as a flag, you know, and then six tours in the Pentagon, both in the political side and in the, you know, in the uniform side, you know, it was a good, it was, those are my, that's my pitch, ma'am. <laughs> Peg, hope that's up. I love it. And I, this is a follow-up question um, because you triggered something that you and I talked about in our preparation for this. Um, would you then go back and tell your junior self or tell those on the call today, would you tell us if we were feeling these imposter syndrome uh, feelings to not waste our energy by over-preparing? Or do you think that preparation is why you were so confident in that other question that you hadn't prepared for? Yeah, I think each person needs to, you know, everyone's different with the amount of information they need to have um, and the amount of preparation they need to do to, to just get to their baseline comfort zone. And I think you always have to get to that place. Um, you know, I think as you get more, as you progress more down the road, then you can kind of understand where you can take a little bit of risk on your preparation. I'll give you another example. We were uh, getting ready to brief, um, you know, a team for that transition team. It was part of our process, you know, that we do is the transition of government. And we had to put together a really big brief and it was kind of a global brief. And I thought, all right, where am I gonna focus? Cause it's like a big globe. And I did have to kind of pare down, all right, I know these might be, these are the key things I'm gonna focus on. And then I'm gonna have some good notes, you know, to be able to refer to if not. But again, I think to be able to have that, what I said back in the beginning about, you know, be confident, you have to be confident with the level of preparation, you know, before anything. It's sort of like when you do your SWO board, you know, you could study forever and you probably will because you really wanna get your SWO pin. And, uh, you know, those things are really important. And, uh, you know, so it's, what's that level of preparation that you know that when you go into that board, you're gonna, you're gonna knock it out of the park and that's that level that you'll find for yourself. Perfect, love it. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to, for our breakout session today, uh, practice one of your uh, six techniques, because um, why not? Let's, let's use this time effect. We've got an hour here, so we're going to uh, use it. And I, I'll hit return here uh, in the chat. So um, what I'll do is break out into small breakout groups. Um, and in your room, and actually, I, I've killed note cards, too, because uh, those of you who aren't reading the chat, uh, I learned this from someone else really smart on this call that taught me that, hey, there's key people. Okay, so there's four steps. Okay, let's see. I wear my note card to keep it fun. Um, so step one is going to be you're going to enter, you're going to introduce yourself, right? And you're going to say uh, you can type in a chat where you're from. So you got step one, ABC. Go ahead and put in your in the, when I put you in breakout rooms, you're going to put down uh, what town you're in, all right? And then uh, you're going to go around or alphabetical order. Then you're going to give an intro. Maybe say what profession you're in. If some of you are transitioning, go ahead and say wh where you're uh, transitioning to. If you are new in a profession or if you're a student. Um, and then let's practice this, uh, this talent of uh, how it is to say what you're good at. That I, like we heard from our friend Ketty, that doesn't come easy to many of us to say, here's what I'm good at. So let's practice that. So go ahead and share kind of hard with someone you just met. I uh, saying, hi, here's who I am and here's what I'm good at. And then um, let's reflect on that and say, uh, was that hard, was that easy? Um, and, and see how that happens. So, what I would like is for, uh, you'll see uh, 10 minutes to do this and you'll get a notification when you got two minutes left. And then when we come back, we'll see how that went. Are there any questions before I break y'all into small groups? You can type in chat or just start speaking. All right, here we go.
recording. Okay, well, welcome back everyone. Looks like I have I put on gallery view. Looks like everyone's come back in. Awesome, we got everyone. All right, does anyone I wanna I just unmute yourself and share uh, what that was like for your group? Sure, I'll jump in, Emily. So I was in a fantastic group with some really stellar uh, women. The thing that is always uh, most wonderful about these sessions is to be able to look out across the gallery and see women, see SWOs. And I just, I wish there was a, a way for us to become more connected more consistently because that camaraderie is just such a wonderful feeling. Every time I lead these sessions, I feel more inspired and empowered. And most of us agreed that it is not, it's, it's not difficult to talk about the things we're good at but it's the reflection of being able to allow ourselves to acknowledge that we are good at those things and mm -hmm. to be able to identify those good things. The talking is not the hard part. It's the actual allowing ourselves to be okay with being good at things. Wow. Interesting distinction. Really awesome. Love it. Thanks hey, for sharing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, we had an interesting uh, small group because one of our members was a doctor who works at Bethesda, AKA, I guess everybody else, Walter Reed. And we were talking about this whole uh, syndrome or whatever you want to call it in the medical profession now with everything with COVID and some of the challenges to when uh, people are thanking medical professionals and, real and they, they realize just how much there is still to learn. And so we SWOs don't have the corner on the imposterism market is another thing that, you know, that came out. Wow, that's right, and across professions. Thanks, Admiral Tabo, thank you for sharing that. Thanks to the doctor who shared that. Certainly helps put things in perspective. Anyone else wanna share? Emily, I think uh, we, we had a fantastic group. It was uh, fun and diverse and, and not just women and not just SWOs, uh, so that was awesome. I think the common, the common thread across our group that I noticed, and we didn't get a whole lot of chance to reflect because we spent a lot of time sharing and introducing ourselves, which was amazing. But it was the fact that everyone started with, I think I'm good at, right? That everyone in the room said that. And it was this, even as we're talking, even as we're following a prompt that says, share what you're good at, we all still, we all still oh, added yeah. a qualifying statement and it was universal in all of them or added justifications as to why uh, we thought we were good at that rather than just owning it. Um, and I will admit to being, you know, in the room and doing the same thing as everybody else. Uh, so that was just, you know, as I, as I was waiting to come back into the main group, I realized that everybody started with, I think I'm good at, and then followed on with stating what we were good at and then qualifying why we thought that to justify, you know, the fact that we had, as if we had to justify our own opinions as to what we're good at when we were following a prompt to brag on yourself. Fascinating, I'm seeing so many heads nod and I'm just jaw dropped because I'm thinking that's right, that what a distinction with one little word and how my voice would just get choked up if I had to start out by saying, I'm good at, that is a choked up hard thing to say compared to, well, I think, I mean, is much more, and I see uh, Liz has joined in from the War College and she's, you know, owns a lot of this research here. So thanks for sharing that. She shared uh, on the chat here, a lot of women uh, generally amount, amount, that we use qualifiers, you know, to, to say that. Um, wow, thanks for sharing that reflection. Anyone else have something they wanna share? Oh, I, I was just gonna say, uh, that's a fascinating observation. I'm glad you made it. I, I did the same exact thing. Um, I think though, that really speaks to um, how we don't wanna come across, I mean, we wanna be humble, right? We don't wanna, we don't want to come right out and, and just brag and, uh, you know, um, Kat, you know, Kat, you, you, I think made that point earlier, um, in, in your presentation or, uh, in your opening comments, but, um, I, I just wonder, like, is that just part of being humble or I don't think it really diminishes the, the, you know, the content of what we're trying to get across. I think it just comes across as, um, being more humble. I don't know, over to the group for thoughts. It's a great question, and I, I'm sure we can even go back to Abel Van Ketty because you and I would talk about that too. The idea of humility and confidence. I mean, because this is that fine line. So sometimes that that's our strength is our humility, um, and by starting it out with a qualifier, um, that opens room for conversation, and you need that humility to have effective teamwork. So there is a fine line there. Emily, it's Annie. 
Um, when I when I was watching the video, one of the first things that popped into my head is I had read in a book um, not too long ago how we have a tendency to make ourselves small so that others feel more comfortable. And when I read mm -hmm. that, I could immediately identify with it. And it seems very similar to what we're talking about here. Yeah, I do remember that Nelson Mandela quoted that in his uh, acceptance speech, right? He quoted um, that, you know, it is, you know, in his attempt to get others to, you know, you're not, you're playing small does not serve the world was the quote that he used, right? Because we try, and sometimes that's entirely appropriate that you do need to be small uh, in order to make others feel big. And that's exactly what your team needs. So there are times when humility is probably the only way. Um, there are probably other times like in an exercise where the assignment is to say, state what you're good at, uh, or when the chairman is interviewing you for a position, that might be a time uh, when you need to, to not use that qualifier. So I was just gonna say, I think a lot of it is a cultural norm and that we've just gotten so used to doing that. So my name is Jill Cesare, sorry. So, um, and I think that women get used to other women doing it and that I've definitely been, um, I was just advising somebody today who um, I work in acquisitions and we compete against, it's surface warfare acquisition professionals, compete for jobs against uh, engineering duty officers as well as uh, GS civilians. And um, when there's a leadership position, it goes to a panel of three or more flag officers or SESs. Um, and the bigger the job, the more people on the panel. And it is amazing to see how different people write about themselves because you have to write a application and you have to say why you believe you're qualified for the job. And so I, before I applied, I read a civilian's application. I read many engineering duty officers applications and I read SWOs and how different each community wrote about themselves. And all of the SWOs said, my team achieved this. And over my years of experience, um, my command or my unit, like they never said I did X, but the engineering duty officers and the civilians did attribute success to themselves. And so I have forced myself to adopt a writing style to say I did save X amount of money or I did achieve an engineering feat because I am competing against those people. And so at some point you've got to accept the cultural norm because the culture may not see that by saying, I think I might be good at something, what you're really saying is something else. And so anyway, I think it's just a culture thing and it's hard to overcome the cultural norms. What a great point of comparison that you were able to see that across three different cultures and then to a, bring it into yourself. And then we're using lots of examples here, some that are in our head and some that are when we're um, promoting ourselves to others. There's almost like, are we using the same voice in our head when we're about to go to a job uh, that, we use in our, that we use outside when we're in a boardroom where we have social expectations for how we're supposed to uh, speak about ourselves, right? Maybe, maybe it's not the same uh, perspective all the time. Maybe there's another way to, to look at that. You guys got right to the heart of it. You guys just dug right in. Man, tough group. We got a tough crowd. I love it. <laughs> what else? I wanted, can, I, can I chime in, Emily? I, I think, the, I think the, the, the humility point is really well taken. And I, I would, I'd be hesitant to step too far away from humility and start saying, I did this, I did that. Um, and I've seen people do that. Uh, I did this, my, my XO did that. And it's kind of I, my mind, and it really turns me off. Uh, and maybe if someone, if someone is predisposed to be overly humble, they may have to move a little bit more in that direction. But I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, give up the humility and the we and the team piece too quickly uh, in the interest of self-assertion. That's, that's my point. Hey Bob, I wonder. I wonder if I'm just way out of turn. So just Emily knows I just diarrhea of the mouth. So just forgive me. Um, but like, I wonder if the assumption is that for women though. Like, I wonder if it's like different. I have no idea. Like, I don't. I don't have women on my baseball team. But like, I don't know. I. Uh, 
I'm wondering if there's almost like a, a nudge to try to be more confident or assertive because maybe the men, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Well, I, 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 That's I think we I welcome do. you to the I, team. Yeah. You're great. I think I do, but I, I, I still, I've had women, I've, I've been with women who have been really assertive and, and everything was I and mine. And uh, I got really suspicious. And, and just like I am with men who are that way. So that's just me. That's just another opinion. You know, and I, this is a great conversation, right? So what we're seeing is that the, uh, when we're trying to convince that we belong to men, uh, I would say that sometimes we need to be, if we have someone like you in the room, Bob, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, we're telling you we belong by, um, you know, showing the humility. And other times if that voice gets in our head though, and it prevents us from showing up to do the work in the first place or prevents us from raising our hand or prevents us from saying something that we're thinking. And then we watch someone else at the table say the exact thing we were just saying as the example Admiral Franchetti, Franchetti gave in her presentation, uh, then it's um, debilitating, right? And so um, that's why you kind of have to dig into this conversation. It's not, it's not a, a one size fits all. Uh, question. I mean, we, they're great. You have to think about this, right? So I, I think you have to know how to read a room, right? There have been times when I've been in a room and, and I, and I do, and I, and I do believe in the team and I'm a team builder and that's what I am at heart. But if you're reading the room and the room is telling you that's not getting you where you need to go, then you have to put your, I call them my Captain McCarthy pants. Then I put my Captain McCarthy pants on and I go all Captain McCarthy on them, right? Because that's what my room is going to respond to. So it's knowing how to read your room and then giving them the thing you need to get you to the next spot. Because ultimately, I would say as leaders, we're trying to actually bring our team behind us. So if we can't put our Captain McCarthy pants on and, and get the ball rolling, the team's gonna suffer too. So great. Wow. Love the perspective. Love the conversation. I'm with Frank Hedy. I uh, promise you the last couple of minutes, I'd love to just turn it over to you, ma'am. Uh, you just put such a nice bow on this and let us unwrap it ourselves uh, and dig in and practice one of the, one of the six. And uh, this is your gift. So Merry Christmas, everyone, from Admiral Frank Hedy. And uh, ma'am, just want to turn it over to you if you have any closing uh, comments. Well, again, thanks again, Emily, and I just, you know, thanks to everybody, I, and this is a really, a really grateful, I mean, a really informative discussion. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of going along in the chat right now, you know, it really is, I think, finding this balance, you know, what we're talking about right now is about how do you project confidence, you know, while still remaining humble, I think, as Bob was saying, hi, Bob, nice to see you, <laughs> um, you know, it, it is, we, especially in our profession, it is all about the team and it's the team that gets us everywhere. And, um, you know, you can't come across as a braggart. You know, you can't come across ever as really full of yourself because then people will doubt you. And, uh, you know, they'll think it's just a hollow promise. So there is, it's that fine line of figuring out how to, you know, exude confidence, understated, you know, confidence without bragging. And, uh, and that will keep your air of humility. I do think that's, you know, it's, it is something that we all have to work on. I think, you know, again, I wanted to just share this idea with you because I was, uh, I got an award at Northwestern a couple of years ago and we were, there were three other women that, that got this award and we were all on the stage and we were just, we were doing interviews with the president at Northwestern. And, you know, I, he was just talking about our experiences growing up, you know, through the university and then in our three very distinct um, professions. And uh, then, you know, this is when this imposter idea came into my mind and all three of us, we we're all roughly about the same age. We all had the same experiences. And, uh, and then it was the president, you know, Morty Shapiro at, at Northwestern who actually put the, t the label uh, on what we were feeling. And again, I think it's just something that we can, we can think about uh, going forward. And I guess, you know, the last piece is in the end, you still have to be you. And uh, you know you have to play to your strengths. You can't be someone you're not, and uh, that is probably the most important thing of everything I said uh, or thought about today. As getting ready for this, is that in the end, it's the it's your uh, authentic self. It's living 
you know, the way that with, with all of the talents that you have, you've got to bring those to bear and play to your strengths. And I think if you continue to do that and you exercise some of these steps or make up your own steps to uh, push that self doubt uh, out of the way, uh, that will just open up a lot more doors as we go forward and uh, continue to build great teams and be great teammates and lead great organizations. So again, I really hope something was useful um, to you today and uh, I wish you all the best for a great holiday. And Emily, thank you very much for uh, teeing all this up. Absolutely, yes, you get lots of applause around the room, man. Thank you for this wonderful Christmas gift. Um, I will uh, take some, um, when I email out the link at the end, I'll just summarize those top six uh, takeaways because those were six really awesome gifts that we had for strategies to use. And then the context that we uh, shared today as we dug in as a team or as a group, and we realized that, hey, there's some nuances here. Sometimes that these applies uh, more than others as we uh, develop as learning leaders. So thank you so much. Wish you all just the most wonderful of holiday seasons. And Admiral Fanchetti, a huge, huge thank you to you and to your team, because I know they had to probably work hard to get you out the door uh, on a Friday. Actually, they thank you because I left <laughs> my office at 1500 today. So on a Friday before the <laughs> holiday period. So thank you, Emily. They were all singing your praises. Absolutely. That's super great. Yes, I know that is very, very early. <laughs> <laughs>